fresh review is, remember, we're at a time period when Constantine, he was the one mainly responsible where the state interfered with church affairs. And that's where we can say practically that Constantine would qualify as the first pope. So how we practically see it, so a lot of secular historians may not see it that way, but practically speaking, he would be qualified as the first pope. For he was the one that got state affairs involved with Roman affairs, and he was the one that helped out with paganism being combined with Christianity itself. But Christianity was an apostasy, because it was under apostasy from, remember, the two evil powers, Alexandria as well as the church fathers. So a monster was being born. During that time period, we're at a broken world where the Roman Empire was falling apart. It was mingled with barbaric tribes, which we can say approximately about 10 barbaric tribes, we can practically say. And it was mingled up with the Western Roman Empire. Remember, the Roman Empire was split with West and East. The East is where eventually we're going to find out where the Orthodox Church came into being. The West is where we get the official Roman Catholic Church. So we're focusing on the Western area, but we're also going to see how it hits toward the Eastern areas. Before we cover those, let's go back to the kingdom and see a little bit more about the history of that time as everything was falling apart. Now remember the empire was crumbling, barbaric tribes were mingling, I mean the culture was in a complete state of a mess. So there was a person named Justinian who tried to revive Rome in its glorious early form. This is found at the book Man and His History which I read to you at previous discipleship works and this will be found in his section concerning about Justinian wars in the West. The writing says, in 527 a very capable man, Justinian, became Roman Emperor. The Eastern Roman Empire consisting of Egypt, Syria, Asia Minor, and most of the Balkans was still intact, but the Western Empire had slipped away entirely from the Emperor's control. Justinian dreamed of reestablishing the Roman Empire as it had existed of old. From 533 to 554, he waged several great wars of reconquest in the West. He took Africa from the Vandals, Italy from the Ostrogoths, and southeastern Spain from the Visigoths. So as we can see that Justinian was the person where he tried to revive Rome to its glorious power and he was conquering this barbaric tribe and that barbaric tribe so he was able to do a few conquests Eastern Roman Empire remember they had a history and a background and their demographic demography where they were able to maintain its powerful form and continue on the Western Roman Empire which is where the Roman Catholic Church is mainly going to come out of is going through problems. So Justinian is the one where they can look up to for help. Continuing on concerning about Justinian. The most lasting achievements of Justinian's reign were artistic and legal rather than military. He adorned Constantinople with many beautiful buildings, including the great church called the Hagia Sophia, which means holy wisdom. This church, which is still standing, has a dome that reaches 180 feet above the floor. Mosaics and colored stones made its interior resplendent with colors, colors that remained undimmed until the Turks captured Constantinople in 1453 and whitewashed the mosaics. So he was the one where he was able to bring the Hagia Sophia, the splendid building for the Eastern Roman Empire area. The Western Roman Empire will get its main building years and years later, which we'll know is St. Peter's. Let's keep reading. By Justinian's time, Roman law filled hundreds of volumes. Why? The reason why is because much of it was out of date or contradictory 
or had fallen into disuse. This created confusion in the courts. To clear up this confusion, Justinian had a group of lawyers go through all the Roman laws and juristic writings and combine in a single work whatever was still of use. The work that they put together is called the Corpus Juris Civilis, which also means the body of civil law. So notice that Justinian was getting into a lot of work concerning legal matters and trying to clean up all the mess that they lost for years and years and years. But obviously, man at his best state is altogether vanity. We see even today people trying to revive its former glory in America and in other kingdoms. Man has not changed. And what happens when you do it without God? It's secular humanism at its best, and a lot of times you don't even achieve your goal. And that's the greatest example of Justinian. He's a great example of that. Continuing reading on, it is divided into three parts, his body of civil law book. The code, which contains the laws that were still in force, the digest, which summarizes the writings of the great jurists, and the institutes, a textbook of law for students. At first, the corpus was used only in the Eastern Empire. In the 11th century, it was introduced into Western Europe and became the foundation of much of European law. In modern times, it has influenced the development of law in every nation that has borrowed Western culture. Justinian's reconquest of so much of the West was in the long run, what, without God? Failure. Make America great again! And failure. <laughs> That's what happens. I'm not trying to rub dirt on our previous presidency. Now today things has changed, right? So that's why I say previous. But aside from that, I know that the previous presidency, that we can find uh, some things that he tried to achieve and help our country and its state. So, but the one that I'm pointing out is basically, ultimately, without the God of Christianity, and when you do it in a compromising format with Roman Catholics, which our previous presidency has done, which there is no doubt about that. In all this sense, without God and a non-compromising format, then it's all a failure, no matter how hard you try. Amen. Only a few years after his death, most of Italy was conquered by a new Germanic tribe, the Lombards. Oh, see, his hard work. The Visigoths reoccupied southeastern Spain, and Africa was shortly to be swallowed up by the Arabs. The great Roman Empire covering the entire Mediterranean world was clearly a thing of the past. Ancient times had come to an end, and a new era. What is the new era? The Dark Ages has started to begin. But then there's a ruler who comes out as emperors, divide and they fall especially with the culture and barbaric tribes mingling more and more and more what we do know is this there is one ruler that stands atop as empires and kingdoms and tribes and rulers divide and fall one person stands out that people look up to and that is the pope during this time and then the roman catholic church will become the system that takes over the world and then that's when the dark ages begin but we'll see who this pope is later on. This pope was the one responsible, and the Dark Ages was able to begin. But before the ugly mother whore of Revelation is able to rear her ugly head, the Lord was doing something else. So remember, the church fathers started a mess of Roman Catholicism mess. It's starting to form the church. Barbaric tribes and paganism is mingled up with that. Alexandria, Egypt has become like a standard uh, city to look up to. It was the Harvard and Princeton that all, quote-unquote, Christian scholars or the churches looked up to. And then the councils, they were meeting together and they maintained power and they were having a dominant hole in kicking out whatever they deemed to be heretic or cults. And during the same time, they were trying to stamp out heresies and cults. There were genuine heretics and cults forming. So we see Arianism was very popular. And we see that I talked about the Gnostics and then all sorts of different cults coming out. 
during this entire mess, and don't forget where we get the mess going on in the Asia lands, Asian districts, where Eastern religions is becoming predominant. You got the big four over there, uh, early Hinduism, and then Taoism, and Confucianism, Buddhism, and then the fifth one, Jainism. So remember, that's dominating the platforms. And then in the Americas, you see corrupt amount of paganism going on where the sons of God seem to be forming. And the Druids at the British Isles, they were imitating the same patterns where the sons of God, you can see their handiwork behind it and paganism growing. So then let's see what God's people were doing. It was at that time that there were still good guys and the Lord was raising up men. Now... Getting ready for this, I told you before, as we go back to the first centuries, the first centuries of the early church, there is something that is significant that you must understand that stood out and is defended. And I've talked to you about one, and that is the King James Bible issue. The second is dispensationalism. During that time, the manuscripts behind the King James Bible was being alive and it was spreading and God's truth is marching on. So then people will say that dispensationalism is a cult teaching. And it was sometime made up at the 1800s. That is not true. In fact, you can go back to the early centuries. God's doctrines of dispensationalism were available during the early years. So I'm going to give you proof of the... I'm going to give you proof on dispensationalism. And I gave a little bit about the King James Bible a couple of discipleships ago. We also tried to debunk the Septuagint the Apocrypha, and the Alexandrian garbage, their works. So now I'm going to start defending it. This is from Frederick Widowson's book again, A Bible Believer Looks at World History. And he gives a list on page 141 all the way to 144. He gives works where the church is actually raptured. He gives quotations of the church being raptured where they don't have to go through the tribulation and he also talks about the doc the early doctrine of dispensationalism of course it wasn't called dispensationalism that time it's a it's a term that you want to know it's chiliasm 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 mm -hmm. This was carried on as far back as the early church fathers. You can go back through there. And then I'll give a few uh, quotes and sources during this time. Victorini, uh, Victorinus at 240 AD. And this is found in his uh, commentary on the Apocalypse 6.14 as well as commentary on the Apocalypse 15.1. Cyprian at 250 AD, and this is found at his Epistle 55, and also he mentions that treatises of Cyprian at 21 to somewhere up to 26. Ephraim the Syrian at 373 AD, he mentions, quote, in his work on the last times too, because all saints and the elect of the Lord are gathered together before the tribulation which is about to come and be taken to the Lord. So the pre-tribulation rapture is not something that's made up in, uh, by Jesuits later on. Jesuits didn't even exist. Come on. The Roman Catholic Church was in its baby form. This is found at Papias 70 through 105, fragment 6. After the resurrection of the dead, Jesus will personally reign for 1,000 years. He was taught this by the Apostle John himself. Now, look at this. So then they taught that Jesus Christ is personally himself going to be reigning for a thousand years. That's a form of doctrine from 
dispensationalism or chiliism. There are people who do not believe Jesus Christ is going to literally come down on the earth and literally reign for a thousand years on the earth. They think that they're going through that kingdom spiritually right now. That's ridiculous. That quotation says that Jesus Christ himself personally reigns. Justin Martyr, 110 to 165. In Dialogue 32, it says, The man of sin, spoken of by Daniel, will rule two times and a half, before the second advent. Ah, look at that. So before the second advent of Christ, there is the Antichrist will rule before that. Dialogue 110. The man of apostasy who speaks strange things against the Most High shall venture to do unlawful deeds on the earth. So as we keep reading on, Irenaeus on 178 AD says against heresies 4.26, Daniel the prophet says, Shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of consummation until many learn and knowledge be completed. For at that time when the dispersion shall be accomplished, they shall know all these things. Against heresies 5.25. Uh, in Second Thessalonians, the falling away is an apostasy and there will be a literal rebuilt temple. A lot of people try to do away revelation and prophecy saying that that was already fulfilled at the first centuries or all these are spiritual applications but notice that all these early church fathers and christians they mentioned that no this is a future time period Amen. and that it will happen now taking it for granted that some people like uh, justin martyr and even augustine and I believe origin as well, obviously, and a lot of the other church fathers and early people, that the, even though they'll give some form of dispensational teaching, they'll adhere to some for, form of uh, post-tribulation type of teaching or some form of post-millennial type of teaching or Catholic teaching. So there's no doubt about that. But remember, as I've taught you, during the early centuries, during the early centuries, it was normal during that time that there is a mess up of wrong doctrines. It's a mess up of wrong doctrines. The point is, is that these right doctrines that we believe in today is not a new form of cultic teaching. It was taught all the way from the early centuries. But our job as Bible believing sick uh, Christians is to look back at the past and see within that messed up of teachings to find which is truth, which is error. What's wrong with that? Amen. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. If, you, if you're going to go by a specific church father as your final authority during that time, guess what? Church fathers contradicted each other. That's right. So that's a major mess. Martin Luther, he mentioned about such a mess with church fathers that he said that the church fathers should not be called church fathers, but rightfully called church babies. That's what <laughs> Martin Luther said. They're not church fathers, they're church babies, rightfully so. So, the Bible should be our final authority. The church fathers, where can they get their final authority? They have to get it from the Word of God, and they're trying to quote from what they believe to be Scripture. And if their quotation contradicts Scripture, guess who I'm going to go with? Scripture, it's that simple. We see Tertullian at 190 to 210 AD at Marcion 3.25. He says, Millennial reign, resurrection, and the new Jerusalem are literal. In the resurrection, we shall then be changed in a moment into the substance of angels. Amen. Look at that. That gets rid of the false notions of anti-dispensational remarks. Oh, the Antichrist is a system. No, Marcion 5.16. The Antichrist will be a real man and set in a real temple. Tertullian. <laughs> Origen at 2.30 AD even mentions it. Again, Celsius 2.49. Uh, quotes Paul about the Antichrist as a literal person who works false miracles. If you look at my video, I mentioned, I have a video about, oh, what's the title? Uh, dispensationalism before Darby. But usually if you go to our dispensationalism playlist, 
we have these uh, long videos and it's dispensationalism part two and part two it also has the title about uh, dispensationalist bef uh, the history of dispensationalist before Darby Ruckman and etc and I give quotes where even Augustine recognizes different dispensations Augustine and Origen and the real bad church fathers even acknowledge that. So there are more. Comma Dianus at 240 AD, Lactantius at 285 AD, Hippolytus, Victorinus at 240 AD, etc. So there's lots and lots of quotations of this dispensationalism, where back then it was referred to as Chiliism, that either a pre-tribulation rapture, a, liter uh, a literal future event of tribulation, antichrist, second advent. It's not all spiritualized. And a literal millennium. So now that we understand that dispensationalism is not a form of cult or some new teaching, two books that I would also recommend is called Ancient Dispensationalism. You should be able to find that uh, through Kindle, easily, Ancient Dispensationalism. And then another one is Dispensationalism Before Darby. Dispensationalism Before Darby. And Brother Ralph don't have to write that because he bought that book. So, dispensa uh, which I stole. So, Dispensationalism <laughs> Before Darby, and as well as Ancient Dispensationalism. These are great books that I would recommend that would prove that Dispensationalism in its teachings was, was during the early centuries. So this is not new. This is not new. But let's look at, uh, but I've already given you some scriptures that proven undoubtedly about dispensational truth at previous discipleship classes. So 2 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 is a classic. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hebrews chapter 1, the first uh, two to three verses. Different times, God operates differently. You also have to look at um, Galatians chapter 3. There was a time of law where they were uh, under that salvation, and then faith, salvation by faith did not come until Jesus Christ died on the cross. Jesus Christ himself is evidence when you look at Luke chapter 4, when he quotes a pa passage at the book of Isaiah, and then he rightly divides a verse because he applies half of the verse to his time period, first advent, and the remaining verse at the second advent. That can be referred to at my video called Dispensationalism Part 1. Dispensationalism Part 1. And it gives so many scriptural evidences for that against the critics. Okay, we established dispensationalism. Let's forget that. Now let's go to KJV. There are two, uh, there are, there is a book that I highly recommended and a second book. And I'm going to repeat it again for the King James Bible. How we know in the early centuries that the manuscripts behind the King James Bible are legit and there is early century, uh, early manuscript evidence for it is because of uh, one book is called Which Bible by Davis Otis Fuller. Great book. I believe that he defends both the two writings, which is, let's look at here, the evidence of second century, all right, writings that competed. Remember Alexandria, Egypt? They boast that their manuscripts are superior because of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Those are their two ancient manuscripts that I taught you at our previous discipleship. But I mentioned we have two manuscript lines that defend the King James Bible. That is just as ancient. And that is Old Syriac. And the other one is Old Latin. These are second century. And I mentioned that at our previous discipleship videos. But I'm going to expound it a little bit more now. Because now we're going to talk about the good guys of that time. Where were they during this whole mess? Oh, they were around. Why didn't I hear about them? Simple. They're not published on CNN as much. They're not published on CNBC. You think they're going to publish these guys? Just like they're doing now, they don't mention what the Christian churches are doing. And what the Christian churches are doing now, trying to win souls to salvation, trying to minister to people spiritually, and trying to advance God's spiritual kingdom to reach, as many, uh, to reach many people with Bible-believing truth as much as much as possible but you don't see that on cnn you think that the secular people of that time and the early roman catholic church system they're going to write news about that for you 
No, they're going to give you fake news. These guys are heretics. These guys are weirdos and cultists. These guys are the ones that's connected to QAnon and the Trump riots at Capitol Hill. That's what that's what history does. Yeah, that's right. His, the world always paints a bleak history on God's people, mm -hmm. just like today. Why? Because they're the ones who control the history books. Christians don't don't dominate the history books. You know what they were dominating? A better history book, the Word of God. That word of God, above all other science textbooks and historical sources, has been preserved miraculously. That's what they were focused on because they don't care about their reputation. They care about the word of God. Their reputation can be sullied throughout history, but God's the one that remembers these people. So let's look at these forgotten heroes who have been sullied. So Old Syriac and Old Latin. Which Bible by Davis Otis Fuller defends it? And he'll give scholastic sources and early writers of that time who are manuscript uh, authorities that defended the works of Old Latin and Old Syriac to be ancient, second centuries. So that's a book that I highly recommend. Edward F. Hill's book is also highly recommended in defending the manuscripts behind the King James Bible. He was defending it. And he even, I believe, mentioned a papyrus man manuscript. That's the oldest type of manuscripts that uh, you name within manuscript evidence. So Edward F. Hill's book, which is called Believing Bible Study. Believing Bible Study. And I believe I recommended those two books uh, last time. But I will repeat it again. Now, let's cover these guys. So, Old Latin. As you'll notice in your board, we're going to cover these important people, the Vaudois. What are the Vaudois? You're, later on, you're going to find out there's a group called Waldensians. And Waldensians, they became a thorn on the side of the Roman Catholic Church system. Um, before I cover Waldensians, let's cover one of the church fathers, actually. i got to mention this uh, church father real quick before I cover the Waldensians. I remembered, uh, remember about John Chrysostom, so I was about to read him, but I didn't get to finish it. So during the church fathers, there was a lot of corruption, undoubtedly. But despite of corruption amongst church fathers, there were some church fathers who were not really good church fathers in the Roman church system. And then to these guys, we can look up to and at least give them credit where they were in opposite, uh, where they stood differently in comparison to the Roman Catholic Church system, even though they adhere to some of it. This is John Chrysostom from AD 347 to 407. Dr. Upman's book, History of the New Testament Church, and this is found on page 263. Chrysostom, also known as the Golden Mouth. You know why he was called the Golden Mouth? Because he took works that were complicated and made it plain language. This was like the Dr. Upman Dr. Ruckman back then, taking scholastic words, turning into plain language, but he preached hard. You should look at some of his language. It's hard stuff. Like, it will scare the hell fire out of you. You talk about politically incorrect man. Was the greatest preacher and expositor of the Syrian Byzantine Greek Church, which was the custodian of the Greek receptus of the King James 1611 Bible. Now, remember, the King James Bible... Remember in your previous discipleship, where did it come from? Right here. Antioch is which region? It's Syria. So you want to pay attention to this region. This is a, usually when people are from that region, then you're pretty much a good guy. Are they free from heresies? No. And please quit giving me, you bunch of Catholic apologists out there and Calvinists, please stop giving me this garbage about well, you know, they taught this heresy, that heresy, these guys that you point out. I already know. Shut up, all right? I repeated that 50,000 times that my members already know. Now, some of you people are just being uh, genuinely innocent and you had no idea and probably said, you said, you told me, Pastor, but didn't the, these guys taught this heresy, that heresy? Know this and let, and let me not repeat it again. I told you from previous discipleships and now there was a whole messed up doctrine that time. So remember this is that they didn't have a complete perfect Bible like you did, especially the benefit of technology where you can search for it and find a verse quickly. They didn't have concordances. 
They were just passing it on through mouth tradition. So we can give them, we have to give our forefathers at least the benefit of the doubt of some right doctrine that they stood for, right. because if they didn't lay that foundation, other people would not have built upon that foundation. Yeah. Baptists, independent fundamental Baptists, just don't pop out like that. Yeah. They got it from previous knowledge from their ancestors and those ancestors from the other ancestors, etc. Mm -hmm. Now let me continue on, otherwise I'm not going to cover all the good guys. We're almost done now with discipleship, so I better get going. He was born at the birthplace of Gentile New Testament Christianity, Antioch, and he was converted and baptized there. He spent six years in study and prayer under the guidance of Abbot Diodorus and Theodore of Mopsuestia, the father of Nestorian theology. Wait a minute. Nestorius, Nestoria. We're going to come back to him later, all right? That's important. He was chosen to be the patriarch of Constantinople in AD 397. At this time, Augustine was 53 years old and Jerome was 67 years old. So despite these two bad, remember these were the champions of uh, church fathers that the Catholic Church relied upon. Thank God there was a good guy in the midst of that, Chrysostom. He was also a huge church father authority that time. Chrysostom was banished for preaching against the sins of the rulers of his day. The religious ruler being Theophilus of Alexandria and the worldly political ruler being the Empress Eudoxia. John was sent out of the country under an armed guard and died in exile near the Black Sea in AD 407. Tradition states that he died on his knees in prayer. So notice that this church father compared to other church fathers, this guy was like, he, uh, he was so serious for the Lord that he was being persecuted. He was not in like a, a typical Calvi, yeah. in the safe haven of the home, not doing, pulling any effort, and then just studying books and books and books and books. This guy preached hard and he was persecuted for it. Uh, if you also look up at uh, other so historical sources, they mention that his last words before he died, you know what he said? Glory be to God for all things. That's the rough saying. So he gave God the glory when he died. Although Chrysostom opposed the Arians and Novatians, he would neither persecute them nor engage with them in angry controversy. However, he violently opposed the arbitrary allegorizing methods of Origen's Alexandrian school. Remember, the sign and tenet of a, a good Christian to find during that time was what? A literalist approach. Dispensationalism is all what? A literalist approach. You've heard some of the quotations from that. Literal millennium, literal antichrist, etc. It's not allegorized. Unlike his Catholic counterparts, Jerome and Augustine, he did not consider Nestorianism to be a heresy from Nestorius. He was a Bible literalist most of the time, although he had his faults when it came to correct interpretation. He had assimilated, as did everyone else, Origen's heresy that an ordained elder was a priest. However, Chrysostom's priest was no monk or sacramental dispenser. Chrysostom's priest was to be a Bible-believing preacher actively engaged in applying practical theology. And although Chrysostom was not smart enough to see that Simon Peter never went further west in Joppa, he did have enough sense to note that Ignatius of Antioch took up the government of the church after Peter and that Peter had preached in Antioch before he preached in Rome. Even though Chrysostom Chrysostom, in some places, had assented to African black magic in regard to the Lord's Supper. He's talking about, you know, the Catholic Mass. <laughs> Dr. Hutton calls it African black magic. He still had the boldness to state that it was the performance of a memorial of the sacrifice at Calvary. So he's not as hardcore Catholic as you would think concerning about the Mass. However, Chrysostom went along with the spirit of the times in regard to the worship of the saints and some of their relics. Chrysostom was an example of the best Bible-believing preacher that anyone could find at that time. At that time. At least the best of the well-known Christian celebrities of church history. He was a much better preacher than any of the Roman Catholic leaders, such as Augustine and Jerome included. 
He was much more biblical in his expositions than any of the Roman Catholic scholars, which is or, include Origen, Jerome, and Clement. And he was much more balanced and sane, sane in his approach to spiritual devotions than any of the monks, nuns, anchorites, yeah, anchorites or flagpole sitters of his days. <laughs> because there were people who were sitting on flagpoles to uh, the monks and nuns, which became very infamous that time for their aestheticism, etc. So as we can see that he was a good man that time, that the Lord used, despite of his misgivings. Now let's talk about the Vaudois. So the Vaudois, there is evidence of these guys that their writings go back as second century. So let me give a quote, and this can be found at uh, Which Bible by Davis Otis Fuller. And then I mentioned another work, but Davis Otis Fuller heavily borrowed from this guy's work, so you may not really even have to look at it. But it's by Benjamin Wilkerson's book. Uh, title is Authorized Version Vindicated. But Davis Otis Fuller's book would do a much uh, easier approach for you to read it. He compiles it better. Anyway, so this is what he says. In the 4th century, Helvidius, a great scholar of northern Italy, accused Jerome, whom the Pope had in power to form a Bible in Latin for Catholicism, with using corrupt Greek manuscripts. Mm. How about that? He, so there was a guy who was accusing Jerome that you're using corrupt Greek manuscripts for your Latin Bible. Now remember, Jerome is responsible for the Latin Vulgate Bible. So then what happened to this old Latin, this old Latin? These good guys were ongoing, but Jerome was the one who corrupted it. Continuing reading on. How could Helvidius have accused Jerome of employing corrupt Greek manuscripts if Helvidius had not had the pure Greek manuscripts? That's a powerful logical argument. And so learned and so powerful in writing and teaching was Jovinian, the pupil of Helvidius, remember that guy who the three church fathers uh, started to pounce on? I gave, that, I gave the name of that guy, a last previous discipleship guy, that the big three was it Ambrosi, and then the other two guys, Augustine and Jerome, tried to uh, pounce against. Why? These guys are weaklings and cowards, that's why. So they had to pounce on Jovinian. Jovinian, the pupil of Helvidius, he was powerful in writing and teaching that it demanded three of Rome's most famous fathers, Augusti, Augustine, Jerome, and Ambrose, which I'm right now, to unite in opposing Jovinian's influence. Even then, it needed the condemnation of the Pope and the banishment of the emperor to prevail. <laughs> but Jovinian's followers lived on and made the way easier for Luther. How about that? See these bunch of, uh, these bunch of weaklings. These bunch of wow -wass. The Lord was just smacking their behinds. The reformers held that the Waldensian church, listen up now, was formed about 120 AD, from which date on they passed down from father to son the teachings they received from the apostles. The Latin Bible, the Italic, was translated from the Greek not later than 157 AD. We are indebted to who? Who's the authority for this? Biza, the renowned associate of Calvin for the statement that the Italic church dates from 120 AD. Biza is a scholar for some of you who didn't know. And Biza, he was the one responsible for the Textus Receptus manuscripts that the King James Bible came from. From the illustrious group of scholars which gathered around Biza, 1590 AD, we may understand how the received text was the bond of union, so that's where the King James Bible came from, uh, was the bond of union between great historic churches. As the 16th century is closing, we see in the beautiful Swiss city of Geneva, Biza, an outstanding champion of Protestantism, the scholar Cyril Lucre, later to become the head of the Greek Catholic Church, and Diodati, also a foremost scholar. As Biza astonishes and confounds the world by restoring manuscripts of that Greek New Testament from which the King James is translated, Diodati takes the same and translates into Italian 
a new and famous edition adopted and circulated by the Waldenges. How about that? So notice that the old Latin was going all the way back then. Now, the Vaudois, that was uh, a more ancient name that was given to these people before Waldensian came out, uh, was it centuries later or years later? But these people, they were famous. The Waldensians, the very early Waldensians, they were famous to memorize scripture. As a matter of fact, I mean, if you read uh, Davis Otis Fuller's book, as well as David, Dun David W. Daniel's book, Did the Catholic Church Really Give Us the Bible? These people, they held uh, they, in their pockets. If you guys uh, aren't the type of people who bring Bible with you during soul winning, these guys had uh, pockets uh, in their jackets and in their pockets uh, containments of the words of God. These people memorized scripture from the top of their head. They would assign people. They would memorize verses and chapters in their minds. One of the famous early Waldensians, as I've told you before, when he was burned by the Roman Catholic Church, he said, you better get more firewood to burn than us Waldensians to burn. Why? Because the word of God is hid in our hearts and it's going to last forever. These guys were a threat to the devil system, but they were going on ever since the early centuries, these Vaudois. They were in the Alps. And they were carrying on their work. Now let's cover another person. Nestorius with his old Syriac Bible. Now Nestorianism, you're going to hear a lot about it, that they are infamous for their heresies. So let's cover ever Asia Minor. Because they talk about, now I read, uh, all. I would advise where you can actually uh, research for yourself about Nestorianism and you can make up your mind. And if you come out with their heresy, that's one way to look at it. If you come out and think that, no, they're not heresy, that's another way to look at it. How I see it as, when I study it, is they're over-dramatizing it concerning its heresy. Now, their teaching may be wrong, but I, when I look at it and study it a bit more, majority is from Catholic writers or people who rely on Catholic authorities about Nestorianism. Because remember, the church fathers were the ones who were uh, debating about Nestorianism. But uh, I, th I see it as over-dramatized, concerning about their heresy. But whether you see it as heresy or not, there is no doubt that they did good pointers, as all the other good guys, like I pointed out. The Nestorians, these people, I mean, do you know where Nestorius was trained? was trained from Nestorius? Right here, the city itself. Now, where can you get a better area than that? Especially in the Word of God. So, I'm. this is where it can be found at... Let me read the works that I have here. Now, this is found at my doctorate paper that I wrote. Encyclopedia Britannica, 1911. So this is found at their 1911 version. And the two names that you can look up in Encyclopedia Britannica, 1911, is Nestorius. And the other one is Nestorians. So you can look up those two, all right? And then it'll back up uh, what I'm about to say here concerning about Nestorius. So let's look at Nestorius, what the Lord raised up to use. And this is where the old Syriac Bible came out of. The old Syriac Bible. The founder of the Nestorians would be Nestorius, who was born around 451 AD. Mm, let's see here. Nestorius and his followers were no exceptions concerning about wrong doctrine. However, the Lord could not have trained Nestorius in any other better place to learn Bible-believing truth than the city of Antioch, the origin of Christianity. He was a literal Bible believer in the sense of strongly believing every word of God literally. <laughs> well, then you know this is a good guy then. That's a sign and a tenet of a right Christian. Quote, Nestorius was trained at Antioch and inherited the Antiochian zeal. Antiochian zeal. Wow. Of what? For exact biblical exegesis and insistence. Wow. Pretty good guy in my book. 
At least he had the proper foundation of a Bible believer, unlike the metaphorical and allegorical views held by the Alexandrians. Nestorius raised his people to oppose the Catholic churches of the West because Nestorius preached, quote, let no one call Mary the mother of God. That's the bigger reason how I see it. Both Alexandria and Rome excommunicated Nestorius and his Antioch churches for their, for their anti-Catholic beliefs. How about that? See, if you, if you get banned from those two evil organizations, you're a good guy on my book. Because they were raised with the Antioch Bible-believing mentality, Nestorius was widely known for having people and churches that were very active in preaching the gospel throughout many areas. This is, quote, confirmed by the evidence of the Synodicon Oriental, the collection of the canons of the Nestorian councils and synods, which shows that the great Syriac church built up by the adherents of Nestorius and every memorable for its zeal in carrying the gospel into Central Asia, China, and India. See what the Lord was raising? Just from one guy. Just from one guy. He was spreading more land than what the Catholic Church could do. What were they doing? Sitting down. Playing politics. Throughout the centuries after Nestorius died, died, his adherents ignited a flame, burning the dark lands of Asia with the light of salvation, quote, as, quote, they traveled far afield as eager and successful missionaries of the gospel. Why? That's another sign and good tenant of that, you know, you're at the right group of people. These guys had a zeal for the gospel, not politics, not stupid debates. They preached the simple plan of grace as far as from the territories of Persia to the ends of China. Their missionary efforts and results are amazing. Here's a quote. They showed a zeal for evangelization, which resulted in the establishment of their influence throughout Asia, as is seen from the bishoprics founded not only in Syria, Armenia, look at the map here, Armenia, Arabia, and Persia, but at Halavan in Media, Mary in Khorasan, Herat, Tashkent, Samarkand, Baluk, Kashgar, and even at Kambalu and Singan Fushi, uh, I can't pronounce this, this Chinese name, in China, and Kalajana and Kranganor in India. So notice that these, uh, you see these Nestorians? They are reaching out like hundreds of thousands of miles and reaching thousands of people. That's how the Lord was using these guys. So here you, you go with your old Latin, the Vaudois, preserving the word of God. And then you got your old Syriac being preserved, but then the, these people were spreading out soul winning. It's just soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. I could just go on for two hours about this, huh? You know, forget the time. Just forget the time and keep going. Wouldn't that be better? Amen. Yeah, it would be much better. The numbers are so startling that it is estimated in one area, quote, 400,000 Syrian Christians, Christians of St. Thomas, see Thomas Saint, who live in Malabar, no doubt, owe their origin to Nestorian missionaries. End of quote. The Nestorians renewed the fire within Christians by building old churches with more new churches around the communities. Raised with the Antioch mentality, they believed every word of God literally, like literal Bible-believing Christians. As a result, many abandoned Catholic aestheticism and mocked Catholic celibacy. <laughs> man, man, look at, and then see, look at these Catholic historians trying to paint them an evil picture. Why? For one teaching that they've done. Due to their fiery zeal of the gospel, they always suffered endless persecution from the world consisting of who? Muslims, Buddhists, Catholics, and Confucianists. See, these guys just went rampantly east and west, tackling all of Satan's system. I think they're really good guys in my book. I don't know of any other group that covered that many enemies during the early centuries. While still under the ban of Rome, the Lord increased their fruits throughout literally many miles of lands and countries, pushing them further eastward into Korea.
But that's another story. It's another story that I'll co cover in later discipleships. But see, that's them during the early times. All right, I have to close here. I have to close here. Man, I'm, I just talk about two groups. Get you going, man. Let's talk. Remember those Gothic barbarians? What are we going to do about these guys? The Lord raised up somebody, Euphilus. And guess what? He's got his Bible going. Old Gothic Bible. What, what are you going to do with these barbaric tribes that are more ancient than the Vikings? God's going to use Euphilus. His story is amazing. Patrick and Columba, they're going to tackle the Druids. So we're going to have a lot of fun talking about this. And then I'm going to talk about the one that was responsible for corrupting everything and reviving the Roman uh, Catholic Church system as the Dark Ages ushered in, Pope Gregory. And then Satan, he's not getting his eyes away from the revival that's spreading throughout Persia and the Orient area. So guess what he's raising up? A guy during that time who's going to ravage lands, and it's not Attila the Hun. Let's cover next discipleship, shall we? It's going to be a lot of exciting stuff. God, my Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers, made us aware more of our history and how important it is to understand where we come from, where the wicked world comes from, and that we don't repeat a pattern. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.